Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Angelus, for that nice introduction. Uh, very wise of you to truncate it. Uh, I realized my reputation as a speaker had preceded me when I came a little early and saw that you had very wisely given out the Best Speaker Award before I spoke. Uh, shows very good judgment. Angelos mentioned that he'd sort of truncated my career, um, the, uh, or description of my career. Maybe this event will actually truncate the career itself. I uh, actually, among other things, was a law professor, and I remember having a strong sense about my teaching qualities when a student came up to me at the end of uh, one of the classes and gushing with enthusiasm said, Professor Danzig, I just don't know how you do it. Your every lecture is better than the next one. <laughs> I thought about that for a while and decided to quit teaching. Um, and it led me eventually into government where, among other things, I became Secretary of the Navy. Uh, and uh, I was speaking once, I thought, effectively, but admittedly at some length, um, when a Marine got up to uh, leave. And that didn't seem to me to be appropriately uh, compatible with the dignity of the Secretary of the Navy. Uh, so I stopped him and asked him where he was going. I didn't think the dignity of the Secretary of the Navy was enhanced by his answer, which was that he was going to get a haircut. Um, <laughs> So I said to him, why didn't you get a haircut before I began speaking? And he said, I didn't need one. Uh, so these factors uh, all suggest to me you were very wise to give out the award long before I spoke. Uh, but I thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to try and uh, do something a little difficult here. Uh, and that is to uh, provide uh, a uh, sort of bridge between the technology world that you all know so well and the Washington policymaker world that you're now physically embedded in, but also functionally so embedded in as we talk about cybersecurity issues. And the challenge in some respects is to talk between the two worlds and not only to talk in a way that's uh, descriptive and analytic, but uh, also that is prescriptive and suggestive. Uh, as Angelo said, this draws in some measure on a uh, paper that I published this last uh, year um, uh, and this concept of living on a diet of poisoned fruit. This is the organization site. You can download it from the web if you like, if you want to follow up on some details. I'm going to go further than the paper today, but some chunk of the footnotes and the like in that document will give you a, a richer background if you want to pursue it further. Um, what I'd like to do today is uh, to give you a sense of the, uh, uh, the world as I see it in terms of particularly admiring the problem first. I'm going to spend a little bit of time just emphasizing the character of what we're having to deal with. But then I'm going to try and go deeper and analyze it. And by analyzing it, uh, I mean to try and point out some of the key things that underlie the world as we see it and abstract. Uh, beyond uh, perhaps kind of everyday concepts that you deal with to some basic propositions. I'm going to give you about a half dozen about why we're in the situation we're in. Uh, and then I'm going to try and move to uh, a, a short description of a terrain that I think would be more familiar to you, which is just kind of some of the kinds of things we're trying to do about it. But what I want to get to particularly is a set of recommendations. And I'm not going to attempt to be comprehensive in those recommendations. I'd want rather to suggest, by and large, things that are new, things that we're not doing, that are not so much on our agenda. Not that I've discovered some incredible curative unknown to the world, but I think uh, there are things to be said about, uh, uh, about this that are not enough on our agendas at, at first. So let me start by, uh, as I say, admiring the problem. Um, a common kind of phrase used these days is the notion that this is a, a wicked problem, that, uh, uh, by which it's meant that it's highly interactive. Uh, it has a number of different components, and these different components create difficulties in, uh, uh, in our actions because, in fact, different parts uh, of the problem can't resolve it without connecting with other parts. So technology, for example, uh, interacts with legal systems, and I've shown you just a little sort of wheel of, uh, of concerns here. I'd particularly emphasize that uh, we have to be concerned, obviously, with business realities. Um, it's great to provide uh, patches, or maybe it's not so great, but it's something to provide patches. Uh, 
on systems that have known vulnerabilities. Um, but when you actually look about why it is that people don't you know, download those patches, the reasons are highly cultural and relate to business imperatives. It may seem like, well, this is just a failure that I ought to be able to drive people towards. But the underlying uh, business reality is that because they're integrating uh, the new software into systems that are highly complex, because some of these systems aren't being shut down on anything uh, like the kind of frequency that uh, would provide immediate response, stores will implement a, few, a big chain of stores, a few stores at a time, and then move on to other stores. And so you're always having some parts of their system lagging considerably in the patching. Or a power company will have an annual shutdown for maintenance. And as far as they're concerned, that's the occasion for uh, updating. And the idea of updating more frequently is one that they can comprehend but not readily integrate into their business model. So you find that problems like this occur uh, with some real frequency. There are also just the kinds of cultural problems in organizations. Uh, I remember talking with a, a chief information security officer for one of the really brand name companies about his difficulties. He said, every rule you come up with, even the most obvious, immediately people ask for exceptions. I said to him, well, give me an example. He said, well, uh, I, I issue a decree that says, never tell anyone your password. Don't share your password with anyone. What could be more basic? I said to him, yeah. He said, immediately the CEO tells me, of course he's sharing his password with his assistant. How else can he or she get into the emails? So if you're going to have some theory of change here, you're going to have to uh, take account of these kinds of variables. I think uh, another aspect of admiring problem is simply the speed of change. Um, it's very difficult, I think, for the layman to cope with, uh, maybe even for you all as well. And the example I use in the Washington National Security Establishment to kind of bring this home is the basic point about the uh, uh, historical, a bit, an historical analog. Um, think about the introduction of gunpowder for a minute into uh, Europe, circa 1300. Um, that's something that uh, over time radically changes the character of warfare, which is a central concern of mine, but the character as well of the state and of the economy. Now suddenly in the warfare context are notions of defense, as for example building castle walls that are straight, have to be abandoned. Our notions of chivalry and leadership change dramatically, because if I stand in front of the army waving my sword, I'm going to be shot dead. Our notions of organizations of militaries change because now I need mass for firepower and I need the ability to bring uh, my troops into a state of training that's way more sophisticated than if I simply raise up farmers to be a kind of posse to go deal with something for a few weeks. So I begin to require standing armies with trained officers who even understand something about ballistics and the like. And then the state changes because I need to have in the state uh, uh, a capability for sustaining these armies, which brings me to taxation and the like. And I also need a munitions industry because if I don't have a munitions industry, I'm going to lose in any future kind of combat. So everything changes. The nature of warfare, the nature of the economy, the nature of the state. My uh, observation is a pretty simple one, which is that the coming in the information age is not less significant than the coming of gunpowder. But all the changes that I just described to you take place essentially over the course of two centuries. And all the changes that we've experienced by and large, and the major changes in the information world have occurred over two decades. So the speed of assimilation is just very, very difficult for policymakers and others. Ann Harrington, a government official, put it nicely to me when we were talking about this and I made the point I've just described. She said, yeah, the problem is that uh, the technology changes at the speed of Moore's law and the people don't. What's in our heads doesn't change that fast. We have all kinds of legacy systems operating in this context. So you see the dramatic changes that we've experienced up till now. I'm going to say a little bit about the, the future uh, shortly. Um, but what I'd like to particularly emphasize is that uh, 
This is a uh, famous quote uh, from uh, that well-known uh, computer scientist, William Faulkner, uh, who said, the past is not dead, it's not even past. Do I have to explain this Faulkner reference to this audience? I'm not sure. Um, we have these overlaps, these co continuities from the, uh, the world that, uh, that has passed and that remain embedded in our systems and give us fundamental problems. So let me give you one example from the national security world that may be a little subtle and uh, illustrative, uh, but perhaps beyond your experience. I think it's important in the way government officials think about digital information systems that by and large they were, in the warfare context, thought of originally and our biggest development of them in the context of espionage and intelligence. The National Security Agency, NSA, is obviously the leading arena of capabilities in, in this regard for us. But it's striking when you think about the national security world um, that uh, it has some kind of implicit norms. In the Cold War, there's a fellow named Tim Moore at uh, New America who uh, helped me to think this out. In the Cold War, we basically uh, didn't interact in a direct conflict way with the Soviet Union. Whenever possible, we avoided that. The battlefield involved various proxies. Think about the Vietnam War and Cuba and other issues like that. But uh, by and large, we didn't have direct confrontation and there was some sense of rules of the road and of restraint. At the same time, in the espionage world, by and large, all bets were off. We didn't go out assassinating each other's uh, chiefs of station, the intelligence officers in each other's capitals and the like. But if you could do something, then that something, uh, by way of discovering intelligence and the like, directly involved confrontation and competition. Comes now the cyber world, and the basic attitude, I think, became all bets are off. It's unrestricted. We don't have these kinds of restraints. As another example, uh, if you use a weapon in DOD, you want to introduce a weapon, there's a whole elaborate legal analysis, almost invisible to the outside world, that says, is this weapon consistent with the laws of war? But what happens in the cyber world is that though the same tools that you were used to, uh, that you would use for espionage and intelligence gathering can also be used for offensive purposes on the battlefield, those tools are in fact treated as though they were simply information gathering tools. And we don't have the kind of legal structure around them or the conceptual structure around them that we have for other things. And that's one of the reasons I think that the government is struggling with the reaction to the Office of Personnel Management hack that you're seeing because the general historical attitude has been there are two kinds of things. There's warfare and there's espionage. But as you know, the cyber straddles both of them. And when they straddle both of them, it creates complications. And so we have historic ways of thinking that while the world is so rapidly changing, those historic ways of thinking uh, are uh, handicapping or limiting us. We have this kind of compartmentalization that no longer, no longer works out. Um, we don't have these kinds of understandings of uh, distinctions between offense and defense that we used to have. They no longer begin to work. Uh, and another example is in the notion of, well, private sector is different from public sector. We used to think about warfare only in the public sector kind of context. What happens when you, uh, by public sector I mean government, what happens when you begin to think more freely? Well, I want to take you uh, uh, back a little bit uh, and just give you a little excerpt from a Chinese document um, written at the end of the 20th century. I published a uh, piece in the New York Times in 1998 doing what every Pentagon official thinks is the most fundamental and wonderful and important thing to do, which was I introduced a new acronym. Um, and I was very proud of it. My new acronym I thought was very cleverly designed. It was called NEW. Uh, the acronym itself, N-E-W, and it stood for non-explosive warfare. And the notion was that uh, there are a lot of things, cyber, biology, et cetera, that are coming that really uh, are weapons that don't go bang, that don't explode, or in the technical phrase, are not kinetic. Um, this had, I think, absolutely characteristic success for me, uh, which is to say nobody talks about it. 
Um, but I uh, nonetheless uh, sort of want to try and revive it by uh, re revealing it here. But along came these two Chinese colonels in 1999, and they can advance the notion of unrestricted warfare, which you can read uh, right up here. Their basic notion was that we're coming into an era of technological violence, that there is no distinction between the battlefield and that the new concepts, which you're hopefully reading off the screen, the new concepts enable us to do a new kind of warfare. And they, uh, they then went on to talk about old and new concept weapons. Uh, we're not trying to kill and destroy so much as we're trying to control. Remember, this is 1999. As we see it, a single stock market crash, a single computer virus can affect these kinds of new concepts ends. What we're trying to do to achieve victory is to control, not to kill. We're entering an era of political, economic, and technological violence. Some morning people will awake to discover with surprise that quite a few gentle and kind things have begun to have offensive and lethal characteristics. Well, you, in the light of the experience of the last decade, will not be surprised at this. Um, um, you, you know these things. We've lived them. Uh, we see it in the world of business where we're dealing with things like IT theft and uh, the kinds of difficulties that I've sketched uh, here. Uh, you see it as well in, in individual lives uh, and not only uh, the negatives but also how the positives are intertwined with the negatives, our sharing of data and the like. Uh, and uh, we're seeing it in, in general in the context of the new, war new warfare that I've suggested to you. Um, so where are we going in regard to this? I don't know. I don't think you know. Um, I published a paper a few years ago called Driving in the Dark, which got some attention because the gist of the argument, as some others have made, for example, Nicholas Tellab, has been uh, we can't see this complex, the evolution of the complex future the emergent realities are going to be uh, challenging for us because, in fact, our headlights only go so far. Um, and if you look at the predictions historically, they're not very valuable. If you go back to 1990 and you look at predictions about how technology change will impact national security, the most striking thing to me is the paucity of attention to the Internet. The Internet's there, as you know. It comes out of DARPA starting in the 70s, becomes uh, relatively robust in the 80s. It's all there, but we don't see it except in retrospect. Uh, there's a wonderful book called uh, Everything is Obvious Once You Know the Answer. In retrospect, we can see all this, but in prospect, we're not good predictors, and we need to recognize that because it's extremely relevant to the world that, uh, that we're dealing with here. Um, the, uh, the fact is I can point to the fact that uh, I know something about the pace of technology change. I know that that transition akin to gunpowder will continue in ever accelerating kinds of ways. And I know there's a huge variety of actions and of actors out there uh, that will occur and that society is becoming ever more dependent on these things. But I can't say a lot more. Um, I do know, though, what I'm concerned about as a national security analyst and what I think policymakers ought to be concerned about, and very particularly I'm concerned about destruction of social processes, that is, say, the undermining of capabilities in uh, things uh, like the financial system or the power companies and the like uh, that provide a backbone for, for our capabilities. And I know that I'm uh, concerned about how things might evolved for individuals apart from the state. I mean, my first reaction as the Internet of Things evolved ever further was that this um, represented uh, a set of risks, but from a national security standpoint, was I all that concerned if somebody can hack my refrigerator or if somebody causes an individual automobile accident and the like. But if, in fact, I'm a terrorist group like ISIS, uh, and I want to create uh, havoc and uh, lack of trust and indeterminacy in other contexts in America, 
Maybe if I can make people very unsure about the safety of their automobiles by periodically causing them to wreak havoc, um, I can achieve my political ends in ways that I need to care about. So there's a sense, if you will, of the character of the problem. Um, and at this point, uh, you might feel uh, a little bit like uh, uh, this is just uh, too much in some dimensions to think about from a policy standpoint, but clearly it needs to be thought about. Um, among the other parts of my background, I was at one point a Supreme Court clerk uh, working not far from here. Uh, for Supreme Court Justice, and another Supreme Court Justice, uh, uh, besides the one I was working for, uh, Justice Douglas, um, who was well known as a misanthropic sort of uh, uh, guy. He, he kind of loved mankind in abstract, but hated the rest of us. Um, but he one day fell to telling a story about his father, which I think uh, really was apocryphal, but is quite illustrative. He said that his father was an itinerant minister who wandered around the Pacific Northwest and one day, uh, he mounted his pulpit and looked out at his audience and found just one guy sitting out there. And he said to that guy, you really want me to go ahead with this service? The guy looked up at him, and Justice Douglas said, uh, the cowboy said, um, well, preacher, I'm just a lonely cowhand, but if I went to the field with food for 40 horses and found just one, I wouldn't let that one go hungry. So Douglas said he thought about, his father thought about that, seemed to make sense, and he proceeded to give a whole service, full board, um, sermon, prayers, hymns. Then he walked to the back, shook hands with his congregation of one. The cowboy shook hands with him and proceeded to wander off. And Douglas says his father couldn't stand it and yelled after the cowboy, how did you like that? And the cowboy says, well, preacher, I'm just a lonely cowhand. But if I went out to the field with food for 40 horses and found just one, I wouldn't dump the whole load on him. <laughs> so the problem in important ways is, how do you get beyond admiring the problem, dumping the whole load on you and on policymakers and the like, wringing our hands and then saying, well, I've contributed some. Uh, I think what we need to do is get at the root causes, and I'm going to just give you a little summary that represents kind of an abstraction up. Um, and I start with uh, the, the phenomenon of uh, the uh, uh, complexity of these systems. Microsoft operating system, they don't reveal their number of lines of code, ballpark 50 million lines of code. I asked a major uh, corporate uh, financial company person to estimate for me how many lines of code his company maintains and he's responsible for. Answer, one trillion. These systems are, as others have observed, the most complex kinds of systems we've invented. And that means that we have extraordinary difficulty observing them. We have extraordinary difficulty uh, enabling us to uh, comprehend what's happening within them. And they have exceptional vulnerability. If you take the notion of, uh, start notion, uh, one bug for every thousand lines of code, a bug doesn't equal a vulnerability, but it gives us some sense of what's involved when you try and write out 50 million lines of code. In fact, um, in conveying to policymakers this point, which is extremely important, I think, their first intuition is, you guys created this problem, it's a technology problem, fix it. Either you were too, if I'm a right-wing politician, you were too much about your peace-loving hippies who uh, didn't care enough about security, or if I'm a left-wing politician, you guys are all capitalists who just wanted to get the software out the door because that's what you got paid for, and you didn't care enough. So I've said to them, okay, think about something in the world you know, the U.S. tax code. U.S. tax code is four million words. Write me a tax code that doesn't have any loopholes. Now, you may object that there are a whole lot of people out there writing tax codes with the intention of putting in loopholes. But my point is, if you write a four million word document in English and give me an army of accountants and lawyers struggling to find what I'll call vulnerabilities in that document, I'll find them. And you ought to understand that you cannot create something of that level of complexity without having these kinds of errors. Now give me 50 million lines of code, which are, of course, even less observable to 
the authors. And remember, you understand, I think, if you reflect on it, this is a mass production operation. It's not like some single person in Microsoft sits there and writes 50 million lines of code and comprehends it. Nobody comprehends it. It is put together as a pastiche of a variety of different things. So don't think that there's a technical answer to this readily available at the scale and complexity that we need it. When you look beneath admiring the problem and start analyzing it, this is a central point. And it is then compounded by the phenomenon of extensibility. It's not just that I've got a Microsoft operating system, it's got to work with an Adobe system, an Excel, et cetera, et cetera. And that interactive effect is going to create complexity beyond anything that uh, my own system did, even if I could somehow generate my own system. It's like the tax code has to work with a whole panoply of other business laws, estate planning laws, et cetera, et cetera. It goes beyond that. Uh, I have a communicative problem. These systems are designed to communicate. You understand that. You can't begin to comprehend how novel that would have looked 40 or 50 years ago if you could go back. In the late 1990s, the director of the CIA, George Tenet, a very smart guy, says with shock in testimony in the Senate, the enemy is on our system. Our networks are open. And of course, that's the case because of the nature of the communication. The more you let people in, the more you connect functions up, the more you obviously enhance the risks associated with these very complex systems. And you understand how fundamental it is that uh, we create that communicative power. It's at the core of the virtues of the system. Uh, the system also concentrates information. Take, for example, uh, Snowden. We've had, historically, from a national security standpoint, many people like Snowden, people who come in and take documents, whatever their motives, and then hand them along. What's unique about Snowden is 1.7 million documents. We've never in the history of espionage had anybody take 1.7 million documents. But it's a consequence of the fact that in these very complex and communicative systems, we concentrate information, which is again inherent in the virtues of the system. I want to create a world in which an analyst can get at information across a number of different domains. I want to have that ability. Uh, and if I'm running a power system, for example, I want to see the whole set of transmission lines and the like. Or if I'm running a pipeline system, which valves are open and which valves are closed. I want, as it turns out, also to collect information, and the information age enables me to do that. Internet of Things will expand exponentially my capability to do that come back to the Office of Personnel Management threat. What we did was to collect some 21.9 million documents, including from me, uh, that ran one to 200 pages, included fingerprints, uh, foreign contacts, histories, embarrassing evidence, and the like, put it all in one place, and collected it so that anybody who hacked into that system could then conveniently have it all, whereas in a pre cyber pre-digital age that wasn't concentrated in those kinds of ways and it wasn't collected with anything like the same vigor because the new information age in ways we all understand enhances that capability. Um, a, a smart man at uh, Microsoft uh, invented the phrase disintermediation. One of the advantages of the digital world is we take human beings out of the loop. It's terrifically advantageous. Uh, uh, if I start dealing with um, people who are intermediaries and in making my dinner reservation or my travel reservation or buying my tickets, most of the time I wind up being frustrated as compared with the digital opportunity to do all that directly myself. On a larger national scale, it's hugely valuable, for example, in government that I've democratized access to information. When I was Secretary of the Navy, I introduced an intranet system. It had all kinds of technological advantages. It saved all kinds of money. But what I really valued was that I could empower somebody in the bureaucracy who needed a new aircraft part to simply see the inventory and order it up without going through the silo of the warehousing people, the logistics people, and the like, all of which held information as a source of power and created division within the organization. 
Removing those human beings is hugely beneficial, but it also removes gatekeepers, guardians, people who may observe what's happening. Wait a minute, somebody's exfiltrating this financial information, or I got a request not just for a new password, but for 50 new passwords, or I had all these changes that human beings might observe. And finally, these systems are amazingly flexible. That is to say, we value the fact that our computers our laptops can do so many different kinds of things, word processing, communication, spreadsheets, etc. The basic point I want to offer comes back to the title of this talk, the title of that paper, and the graphic I showed you before. This is poison fruit. This is not a Luddite position I'm taking. There's no way to turn this clock back. I don't want to turn it back. But we need to recognize that inherent in each virtue, and I've just summarized them on the side, is the risk that to the degree that I concentrate or communicate or take people out of the loop, etc., to the degree I buy the benefits of this technology, and each and every one of those steps I introduce security consequences that are give risk, give rise to greater risk. The virtue of the system is intertwined with its limitations, its liabilities, and its risk. And that is fundamental. It's not just that the complexity of the system gives me these problems. One reason the technology fixes don't just get me there is every time I buy more, more security, I tend to do so in ways that uh, involve some sacrifice of virtues. Um, I want to spend a minute, having talked about software, just to say a little bit about hardware, because uh, the hardware insecurities are quite quite real as well, uh, and you're aware of that. The easy example I'd like to give is just people tend to think about supply chain in all kinds of sophisticated ways, what's being made in China that goes into the F-35 or latest fighter aircraft, et cetera. What I'm struck by is even if you've preserved your whole system, um, if it turns out that uh, something you use to power, uh, to get more power for your iPhone, as for example, uh, uh, simply a, a plug-in adapter is made uh, with uh, a device in it that enables hacking into your iPhone, that connection is a fundamental problem. So the range of issues is extraordinarily uh, great here. Um, and uh, from an espionage standpoint, I just would point out to you, you're all familiar with the Stuxnet experience. Less talked about is the fact that the Iranians moved to a particular uh, set of frequency converters and the like because they became convinced that some foreign power had hacked into what they were buying to install in their nuclear establishment um, from, uh, from abroad, and they had to begin to produce their own stuff, which then, of course, set them up for the vulnerabilities of some of their own stuff and also introduced a variety of kind of inefficiencies. So the global supply chain gives us a chance to uh, for yet more vulnerability associated with the hardware world. And I want to show this sophisticated audience this point by just giving you uh, a chance to reflect for a moment on a statistic you're not often probably exposed to, which is, um, I want to ask a very simple question, which is um, with respect to uh, uh, the question of uh, uh, transistors. Uh, there's a, a nice little cartoon that says, um, this guy says, you know, it's time for us to begin to spend more time to his, with our children, he says to his wife. Um, how many do we have? Um, if you think about that as a, uh, a problem, think about our transistor world and imagine the question, how many transistors are manufactured globally every second? I just want you to think about this answer. I'm not going to embarrass anybody by having you stand up or embarrass me by having one of you already having known the answer. Let me tell you, when I first began to think about this a couple of years ago, I spent uh, a fair while and did a sort of back of the envelope calculation. And the number was so unnerving for me that uh, I managed to get some friends at Intel to get to work on it. And they eventually commandeered the Intel Research Department. They came up with a number that was so disorienting that we then had a couple of hours of phone calls. Finally, we agreed on a number. So I want you to think about this question. How many transistors are manufactured worldwide per second? Just as a measure of how well you understand this. You got your number in your head? 
every second, 14 trillion transistors. The complexity of this system, the difficulty of policing it in the hardware side needs to be appreciated. And then, of course, there's the human side. Here's a nice picture of Snowden. Um, before Snowden, we had Manning. Um, the openness of the system to third parties is pretty striking. One of the leading theories about Stuxnet is Iranians thought they had their system air-gapped, that there was a distance between their centrifuge system and its software, a physical distance, and the, the outside world. But of course, all kinds of things happen. Patches come down, the system needs to be updated, contractors need to go in, and one of the theories about Stuxnet is maybe some contractor got infected, brought in the virus, et cetera. If you're running a, uh, a worldwide corporation, an aerospace corporation, for example, you have to integrate with all kinds of suppliers from all kinds of portions of the world. Um, and that uh, then causes you to share information. Large numbers of people have access to this information. Huge problem. And even if those people are not malevolent, the ability to manipulate these people is pretty great. If people haven't read Mitnick's book, I always encourage, or one of Mitnick's books, I always encourage them to do so. You know, almost impossible to read that without realizing that you too could be fooled by Mitnick and some clever uh, social engineering. Every system, when you look at it, winds up having mismanagement problems and configuration problems outside the software and outside the hardware. I've given you my password example already. So you're familiar with many of the efforts to deal with this. Um, the countermeasures uh, are a long history. Uh, we know that we tried barriers and training, but we had fundamental problems uh, with these. They leak uh, very badly. Uh, the screening and the antivirals, you're familiar with the set of issues associated with that, the dependency on pre-existing signatures, the way in which the antivirals lag the attacks, the way in which uh, many of them actually import vulnerabilities themselves and can be used as, uh, as bases for e uh, exploits. We've done a lot of hunting of vulnerabilities. It's nice to see the rise of that effort. I think it's, as I'll show you in a second, produced some benefit. So is active defense, but that uh, monitoring of the situation and the like yields uh, also limited uh, benefits. We can create enclaves and encrypt to greater degrees, a very useful kind of thing. But again, the information needs to be shared, and as soon as we get into the sharing, we get into all the kinds of vulnerabilities that are described and the inherent software vulnerabilities that may exist. It's hard for me to believe, and when you talk with the sophisticated inside operator, it's hard for them to believe that they can't get into most anything if you really cared enough and had enough resources. Um, I uh, talked with somebody who makes a career of it, uh, goes around dealing with complex industrial systems, and I asked him how many times he's unable to penetrate his, uh, his client. He says it might have happened once. Um, it's so unusual. Uh, the vice president for security at Google um, has said in a public context uh, that when Google organizes red teams, uh, they succeed in getting in 60% of the time. They're thwarted 40% of the time. That's Google defending itself against its red teams. Um, I think we overstate the degree to which uh, we can defend these systems. And what happens is corporations uh, like to hire red teams that affirm the qualities of the people who hired them. Uh, so you don't wind up getting good, penet uh, good penetration analysis, ultimately, about what serious attackers would do. I'm going to come back to the deterrence point. I want to note that a lot of what we're doing, in effect, is raising the cost for attackers, not actually preventing them from ultimately uh, penetrating. And I began to try and think about ways to document that. One of the things I did was to uh, get a company that um, has done some, uh, that's involved in vulnerability hunting and exploit development. And I asked them to go back and go through their records and show me just a rough indicator. I don't want to make too much of this. It's just illustrative. Um, what's happened over time in terms of their uh, production function for vulnerability discovery? How many researchers of medium quality do they need to find major vulnerabilities? 
And basically, this chart uh, from 2006 to 2011 shows you their production function and shows you that, in fact, it's gotten harder to find vulnerabilities as we get things like fuzzing and a whole lot of different kinds of vulnerability hunts that are out there. But if one researcher could produce or find two significant vulnerabilities in a year back in 2006 and only finds a half in, uh, that is, it takes him two years to find a vulnerability on average in 2011, we've significantly raised the cost for attackers. It's now four times as difficult as it was before by this rough illustrative measure. Um, but it just means that if you hired four times as many people, you'd come produce the same number of vulnerabilities. I'm simplifying, but I think you see the illustration. Another manifestation is look at the vulnerability market. Uh, look at the government productions. Uh, here's a CERT report. Every week we get a description of substantial vulnerabilities. Or look at Pawn to Own and look at the successes that are enjoyed at it uh, by the top level people uh, or uh, the, even the people who don't win, the, who are not at the very end of the distribution and win the top prizes. So you understand all this. Um, hopefully, this is a way of conveying the problem, and I want just in my closing minutes to talk a little bit about my own view about things we could do to improve our situation given where we are. First of all, fundamental proposition that emerges from this is presume vulnerability. Presume that digital vulnerability, and in critical systems, treat this as though it's contested territory, a phrase of Mike Asante's uh, used in some, uh, uh, in some uh, uh, congressional testimony. Create lean systems, that is ones with fewer attack surfaces, and recognize if this is poison fruit, go on a diet, ask yourself, do I really need this functionality? Because it's introducing vulnerability. And that doesn't just mean enclaves and the like. An easy example for me is a printer. Most people think that they want a printer to print. Seems pretty evident. They don't think enough about what marrying up the fax capability with that print capability does in terms of communicativity and connection to the outside world. How about the fact that my uh, printer has a Bluetooth capability that enhances its vulnerability? How do I feel about memory in my printer? Most people are buying memory in their printer and don't want it. I come back, for example, to the example of Snowden. He could steal 1.7 million documents. How come he could copy them? I see why, as an administrator, he could get access. But as an administrator, there was nothing that gave him a need to take the stuff out. So far as I can tell from the outside, um, the answer to that is um, the NSA people are not dumb. They disabled the computer capability uh, that would enable replication. Um, but Snowden is not dumb, and he, with a screwdriver, re-enabled it. So my question is, why did it have that capability to begin with? And the answer is because we buy standard kind of computers in these contexts all the time. They come equipped with this huge range of capabilities. What we should be doing is thinking more about buying leanness, about slimming down our systems. Um, I think we also ought to think about the virtues of out-of-band systems uh, and about analog. So let me come back to Stuxnet again as an example. One of the things that's striking about Stuxnet is it was not just a penetration of, a, uh, of, a, of the, the systems that controlled the centrifuges. It was, and we know this from the public documentation, um, a system that also deceived the Iranian operators as to what was happening by playing back to them simply standard operation of centrifuges when in fact the, uh, the centrifuges were spinning out of control. Fundamental design implication of this is do not convert your situational observation capabilities and your safety systems to the same modality as your operating systems. If the Iranians had had a plain old analog system that measured vibrations of centrifuges and when the vibrations began to get out of control, sounded a physical alarm that rang, no digital attacker from a distance could have thwarted that system. Maybe somebody could have gotten in the room and disabled one or five or ten, but the centralization and concentration of the digital system and its communicativity 
would have been offset by a plain old analog system. Or I have a friend who comes out of the uh, central intelligence world. He's paranoid. His paranoia leads him to have video cameras everywhere in his house. But being a smart guy, he's paranoid about his video cameras and worried that people from the outside world might tap into his cameras and observe everything in his house. So what does he do? Uh, he uh, puts an index card next to the video cameras when he goes out so that if the camera is swiveled, the index card falls over. An analog system. All I'm suggesting is where systems are critical, we ought to be going through our safety and control systems particularly, and where possible inserting analog capabilities or creating resilience in our operating systems by having analog stand, along, stand alongside. This is a back to the future kind of prescription. But if you believe that, as I do, that the digital systems are inherently insecure, you want this complementarity here. You also want to separate those systems so the contamination of one doesn't lead to others. You want, in the words of the resilience theorists, to decrease the amount of coupling, the degree of integration. So I like having an Apple system alongside a Microsoft system simply because I've got then some diversity of, of vulnerabilities or to use a phrase that Dan Geer has repeatedly used and made famous, I want to avoid a monoculture. Um, I want to create resilience in this system. From a public policy standpoint, I ought to be saying, hey, there are some systems out there, the power system, the financial system, that this country depends on so fundamentally that I'm going to impose some degree of requirement on them that they measure up in security terms. They are what we recognize in other arenas too big to fail. We regulate our airplane systems and the like, demand safety standards. We need to do similar kinds of things, in my view, in the internet world. But you have to recognize the speed of change. And so you can't, in my view, regulate it by saying you must do X, Y, and Z, because when you do X, Y, and Z, uh, it becomes too uh, straitjacketing and limiting. And there's too much variation between too many different systems. So I would delegate this regulatory kind of requirement to the relevant cabinet departments. I wouldn't have some overall cyber czar uh, uh, impose it. And I would encourage them to use persuasion, subsidies, everything possible, including ultimately regulation, uh, to get companies to the point where they provided a convincing case that they'd done what they could to reduce these vulnerabilities they diversified and the like. Disaggregating the problem is very important. We need, I think, to uh, recognize the fundamental differences between different industries in these contexts. Um, for example, um, the finance and the power industries are dramatically different in their business cases. Come back to this uh, point about the interaction between technology and business culture. If I run a finance company, I'm being attacked all the time, every day, millions of times. I'm constantly refreshing my software, policing my boundaries, understand that my fundamental assets are digital, uh, they're not physical, and uh, I'm at the very cutting edge of software and the like. What I want from government is information about attacks, and by and large, I want them to help share that kind of information, and I want them to leave me in a high degree of freedom. If I run a power company, I'm not as used to these kinds of frequencies of attacks. I have a much slower cycle of operation. I, my financial base is regulated. I can't pour money in at any given time. I have an annual maintenance downtime period. I'm going to react much more slowly. I have a whole different set of requirements. I need a lot of basic education from the government about what's out there and some raising of my standards with regard to it and my attention. Uh, with regard to it. And that's just an example, uh, and therefore I'm very inclined to push this problem within Washington to each of the relevant government departments. Um, I'm uh, very much an enthusiast about longer term uh, research and development in this arena. I've sketched why it is that I think that the problems are inherent in the technology. But there are opportunities in terms of making encryption easier to use, something we've just talked about here. 
uh, in terms of use of formal languages to scale up our capabilities to provide more protection. And the basic design of our systems uh, with a security focus would yield, I think, uh, a lot more benefits. So for example, I'm a former Secretary of the Navy, so I say as the Navy develops its next generation of submarine or destroyer, let's uh, make it a national goal to say, how will I design this system so as to reduce its vulnerabilities, to minimize the amount of poison fruit it consumes, maximize my use of analog and out-of-band systems, maximize my use of formal language protections at some key junctions, et cetera. And when I've designed that system, I'm going to come up with something very different from the traditional battleship. Or I could do the same in the context of the power industry. For example, in the Navy world, I wanted integration of information at the bridge, historically, the captain on the ship, to see it all. But of course, in a, in a digital age, that creates a particular comprehensive set of vulnerabilities. So how would I design my ship fundamentally different conceptually if I take account of this? That's a project worth doing over the course of a decade while we evolve another system. Or um, I talked recently uh, to the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, and my basic theme pushing the analog kind of notion there was you guys are really good historically at safety analysis and regulation and the like. So you say, for example, that we need I'll make up a number here, 10 different cooling capabilities so that if one or two or three fail, I've got the ability to bring in the others. And when you get some significant number, you think you've built in resilience and safety. Now you go ahead, though, and improve the modernization and digital systems that will control these, and you've created one single failure point in what previously were 10 different failure points. You need, as regulators, to recognize that but also as we design new systems, you need to uh, create uh, good thinking about how we uh, build in better protection against those vulnerabilities. I also, uh, because I care so much about the business culture and the like, I'd suggest it isn't just a technological problem and the tendency overwhelmingly in Washington is to invest in the technology and the R&D money and technology dollars. I'd, I'd, I'd like many more investments in the sociology and anthropology associated with the use of these systems. It's why Johnny doesn't use encryption, it's, but it's applied to the larger system as a whole. Uh, we need to understand better what's going on within these systems. We need, and a number of people have recognized this, better pooling of attack information. Um, and I've suggested in that paper a year ago, uh, this is a nice example of how this is done. A private corporation, MITRE, um, in the FAA world, federal aviation world, recognized the FAA collected data on all uh, aerial accidents, but didn't on near misses. There was a whole big issue. How do we share information about near misses? People said, I don't want the FAA regulating it. They set up a private entity. In the beginning, only one or two airlines cooperated. Over time, with airlines on the board and the like, ever-increasing numbers did. It now covers essentially all of the US aviation industry. FAA has a seat on the board, but FAA doesn't control the information. The information is then uh, anonymized and shared more broadly. Uh, and th that, to me, is a, a readily achievable model. I don't need legislation and the like. I can move forward in that regard. Power companies are beginning to do some of this uh, through FERC and other kinds of activities. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, add that uh, I'm very concerned about the federal workforce, and this is a good example of how we might move uh, in this context from uh, the traditional ways of doing business, which historically those legacy systems are so embedded, the past is not dead, it's not even past. We have a whole set of federal hiring and training standards and methods of organizing that are very ill-adapted to the digital world that, that I've just described. Um, my suggestion is we could create a federally funded uh, research and development corporation, an FFRDC, that's a private company. There are many such that already exist. I'm on the board of one, uh, but uh, I'm not pushing this for them, just as a general proposition 
we could create a new one that would be a place for uh, people who were cyber skilled to come together and be hired. How would you hire them? Well, I don't really care in the arena you all work in so much about degrees and traditional credentials. What I care about is skill at actually, for example, finding vulnerabilities or dealing with other people's exploits. Um, so maybe I should hire by tournament um, and hire winners who achieve in these contexts. What do I want to do in terms of training and the like? I want to put these people together in a pool because so much that's learned is from on-the-job training, not just being in one agency, but moving between different federal agencies. And they learn from each other as peers. I want somebody who's cyber skilled to run this. I want to think about putting it in a place like Silicon Valley. Why do I need it in Washington? And now suddenly I begin to be able to draw a different kind of talent pool, which I can tell you I think we desperately need. And finally, uh, I want to just conclude by talking for a moment about norms and deterrence, and then I want to invite your questions. Um, a lot of fuss now about uh, the challenges of our conflicts with the Chinese, people indicted in Pittsburgh from the PLA, People's Liberation Army in China. We have obvious sources of conflict over espionage and over uh, IP theft. The point I'd make, though, is we also have some areas um, of strategic stability. We haven't yet seen states attack one another to speak of in the context of shutting down their power systems or undermining their financial systems, the big catastrophic kinds of things that I'd be concerned about. And I think we and, for example, China or Russia have common interests in avoiding that form of warfare. It's just not good for either of us, ultimately. Or to give you a slightly more technical but suggestive example, I don't think it serves either China or us to probe each other's nuclear command and control networks with our espionage tools. Why is that? Because we've recognized that we have systems that have gone somewhat under the name of mutually assured destruction, MAD, that say, it's better if the Chinese have a second strike capability than if they don't. Because if they only have the ability to strike first and we threaten destroying their missiles, they need to launch. But if they know they have the ability to survive and attack us, even if we attack first, the situation will be more stable. They'll be less likely to attack in a hair trigger way. But if the whole system depends on cyber system and the system is inherently insecure, and we're out there probing them, and they're out there probing us. And the same tools, as I said earlier, that can be used for the espionage can be used for offense. Now I've introduced insecurity into that world. I've moved from a world of mad to what uh, I will call a world of mud, mutually unassured destruction. You see, I still retain the same fondness for acronyms. Mutually unassured destruction is less stable. We can find our way towards some emergent norms that agree there are certain kinds of things we won't do. There are a lot of problems with this, a lot of challenges in negotiating it, enforcing it and the like. We can talk about them if you want. But the reality is that when we entered the nuclear age, we had no idea about arms control or how to do it. And slowly over time, as an emergent characteristic of the systems, we began to find our way towards some stability. And then we thought about them and we began to articulate them in norms and in arms control agreements and so forth. And we need, in my opinion, to do the same thing in the cyber world. So I've given you a, uh, a real soup to nuts thing. It may be that I've uh, dumped the whole load on you too excessively. Um, but I want to suggest um, we all admire the problem. We all see that it's a brave new world, that these changes compressed into decades or the equivalent of gunpowder over the period of centuries, that we can't think as fast as the situation demands. But we need, I think, to move beyond that sensation to really trying to analyze the core of our problems, and I've tried to give you a little summary of that today, and to thinking not just about the kinds of incremental defensive kinds of activities that I've made reference to, but also most fundamentally to try and to structure institutions and our programs and our norms in light of our analysis in ways that can make us stronger. Will we ever be completely protected and okay in this area? No. 
Uh, but we can improve our batting average quite significantly. I can't guarantee uh, performance or success in every single pitch that's thrown at me, but I know how it is that I could get to a better world with a much higher success rate, a better batting average. And boy, uh, I would extraordinarily value that. So I thank you all for not having gone out for haircuts. Um, and I invite your questions. Thanks very much. Yeah. Hi, Rick Farrow, Usenix. Yeah, I, I love it, very eloquent. I, I really loved a lot of your points. I mean, if there's one thing I could You don't ask, have to go on beyond that. You can just stop there. Oh, OK, you know, thanks. Thanks. Um, if there was one thing I, I could ask for in the form of regulation, which you know, is sort of a dirty word in our business, it would be that when people deliver a product, it'd be like you mentioned, slim down. It'd be minimized. There was a wonderful example yesterday at Woot during the, um, the telematics talk given by Stefan Savage's students. And in that case, there's a device that plugs into the OBD port of an automobile. Any modern automobile would have this. It gets, you can control it with SMS messages. You can use an SMS message, like you send a text message to it, and tell it to update itself from the server of your choice. So you can have it do anything. This device has all the software on it needed for not compiling, but for managing the system. It has not been slimmed down. And of course, it has total control over the car, braking, disabling the brakes, windshield, you know, trivial things. This is actually more serious than what Charlie Miller was talking about at his at um, Black Hat. So simply having, and why this happens is because people, most developers are clueless. They build a system, they're glad it works, and then they ship it out the door. They don't know that they need to clean it up and slim it down and minimize it so the footprint that you can see from the network is a very safe one. So that would be a simple thing that we could do. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you're right. I think we see this uh, very richly in lots of different arenas, and you've given one good example. By the way, the TV folks have departed, so you can preserve your anonymity, which puts you a step ahead of me. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, uh, I think the reality is we're going to get there. We're going to get to a world in which there will be more security in these devices and instruments and the Internet of Things. Um, the question is how fast. The reason I say that is the disasters that you're worried about and I'm worried about are going to occur. The question I think will be how much we can minimize them in advance uh, and how much we can prepare uh, ourselves so that if and when they do occur, we're able to respond with some rapidity and effectiveness we can at least program some capability into those systems. And in my opinion, the challenge of thought leadership in this area, whether in government or within the industry, is to get ahead of the problem. Mm -hmm. It will not be broadly accepted until that moment. But if, for example, until we have that crisis, but if, for example, you're a manufacturer and you design your automobile to pay attention to security, it may not give you any market leverage now, and everybody may argue against it within the company, but if you can see that there will come a time where that will be a defining characteristic that people will demand, then you can have the foresight to make a financial investment against that. I think that's a winning strategy. So I'm trying to kind of get people, as you're trying to get us, to be more sensitive to this issue so that we move further down that road. And at least when the crisis comes, we're able to adapt. I wish I could do more. That's the most. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, full disclosure, I'm from Russia, so um, my, my question is, well, first, you Americans are you scary. You think that's full disclosure, that's the extent of it. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so first, you're very scary because, like, well, your nuclear facilities are connected to the internet, so you assume that China or Russia can attack your nuclear facilities and launch missiles. Second thing is that, how do you even know that it's Russia or China? Like, there was a news... I'm sorry, like, how do you know? Yeah, so, like, a week ago, there were news on the media that Russia hacked into Pentagon. How do you know it's Russia, right? So you're right. threatening nuclear weapons against China or Russia for like a cyber attack, and that's a common trend in the US right now. So 
uh, U.S. Uh, officials say, well, if somebody is trying to hack us, we're going to respond with like full, right. you know, nuclear response, right? I write malware. I write like some Chinese letters in it. I launch it from Chinese IP address, and then you know, oh, let's wipe China, right? Right. So it's kind so of scary. So you're, you're raising a very important question: the question of attribution. How do you know uh, where this comes from? Um, the, I've thought several different things over the years about, uh, or months, about attribution. Um, I've come to the conclusion that uh, attribution in the cyber arena, in the digital arena, is not dramatically easier or harder than in other arenas. And this is very contrary to the accepted wisdom I recognize. Um, there are some instances, let's take the Sony hack, where it appears from the outside, and it's just an observation from the newspaper accounts, that um, it's relatively easy. Government officials have said publicly this is one of the easiest attributions they've had occasion to do. Why is it easy? Well, it's partly a technical analysis, what IP addresses are used, through what gateways. It's also what kinds of tools are being used. Are we familiar with them? Are they being used elsewhere? But it's also uh, political and motivational. Now, is it subject to spoofing? Yes. If I want to inst inst instill war between North Korea and uh, the United States, I could go through some of these steps. But I'm going to have a lot of difficulty getting all the earmarks right. And uh, there are other contexts where attackers are vastly more subtle. But this is not fundamentally different from most arenas of attribution involving criminality or uh, other kinds of instruments. When, for example, uh, biological attacks were launched in the wake of 9-11 involving anthrax letters, it took the FBI six years to figure out the perpetrator. In the end, you use a whole lot of different kinds of sources in different dimensions, not just technological ones. You use some insight into your enemy's systems, human informants, observations about patterns of behavior and the like. And it's hard for attackers to completely avoid all of those. So you wind up, I think, with about the same ability to make an attributive judgment as you do in other arenas. Um, it's not easy in many cases. It's easier in others. It's always challenging, but in my opinion, it's doable. It's you like look like you want the last CIA word. Mike makes one mistake, then like China is gone, right? So. Well, one intelligence mistake and then, uh -huh. you know, a nuclear bomb, right? Yeah, well, I don't intend to launch nuclear weapons based on one theory in this context, but, but thank you for your Thanks. comment. Yeah. Hi, uh, Joe Marks from Politico. I wanted to ask two quick questions. First, on the FFRDC question, I'm, right. I'm wondering what you think of the U.S. Digital Service and if that meets some of those requirements and how the FFRDC idea would be different uh, for developing cyber talent in the government. And then second, to follow up on what our Russian friend was asking, uh, is the, on a, I don't know if it's even a policy level, but is the U U.S. government in a difficult position with attribution because uh, it attributes, in the case of Sony, doesn't attribute in things that are sort of widely attributed anonymously to China or Russia, and so we sort of attribute when it's convenient, we don't when it's don't, and that makes our uh, credibility somewhat more difficult. Yeah, I think on the attribution point, our credibility uh, is challenged by the difficulty. I'm sorry, I want to just ask you to come back to your FFRDC question in a moment. But um, uh, our credibility is, I think, diminished by, uh, first, our unwillingness to reveal a lot of information, sources and methods. Understandable, we're reluctant to do it. And second, by the variation that you describe, where sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. But the government. Uh, actors have different motivations in different circumstances and different considerations, and that variation in credibility strikes me as a consequence of the fact that they're responding to other considerations. Um, and I think it's natural that they mix. If, for example, you think China did X, and Xi Jinping is coming to a visit in September, do you want to use this as a time in which you point that out and inflame relationships, or do you care about other issues particularly? Or if you think all bets are off in government espionage and you're doing all kinds of things, and you're trying to emphasize that using private espionage is not desirable, you may have a wholly different view about, about uh, how much you're going to say about this. So I understand that they have these conflicting pressures, and I think it's not unreasonable. 
I'm sorry, I just wanted you to ask your FFRDC question again because I didn't quite get what you want me to say. Oh, there's a, the U.S. Digital Service, which was developed yeah. under the federal CIO and has been doing a little bit of this right. work, going into different agencies and looking at cyber concerns. It's, it's broader than just cybersecurity. Right. It's a lot of IT things, too. How does that differ, and do you think that that's a, yeah. a noble experiment? I'm, I'm entirely fine with any of a lot of different methodologies for building this labor pool. Mm -hmm. But what I'd like to do is build a labor pool in the high hundreds, up towards a thousand or something, mm -hmm of people who move around between different agencies of the federal government and who have a, an esprit de corps akin to the kind we get in Silicon Valley. Uh, and I don't think we've achieved that yet. It may be that the corporate environment you're describing is every bit as good. I'm just using that as an illustrative one. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Richard. Uh, Stefan Savage, UCSD. So I wanted to actually follow up on the labor uh, development question. So. Uh, one of the, the really great things for all of the young people in this room is that I can guarantee that they all have jobs. They are in one of the best fields to be in in order to have guaranteed employment uh, going forward. One of the challenges, though, I mean, I you could even become a professor at some university or something. I do right? not wish that on them. <laughs> <laughs> exceed, exceed, your, uh, exceed your mentors. Uh, I, I'm really glad about two things. One is that the TV cameras are off, and the other is that you're tenured, Stefan. So, but here, here's my concern. So our students routinely, even undergrads, will graduate and will get paid in industry above a GS-15 rate. Right. And so, and there appears to be an infinite corporate capacity to hire in security at this point because it's not a unique crisis, for example, for the federal government, but it is a private sector crisis as well. H how is the federal government to, in fact, compete with the demand in the private sector when they have real needs that are just not as sexy to our students? So I think there are three answers. Uh, uh, first, you're right. Um, the federal government will always lose people for the reasons you're describing. Um, it's a real problem. Second, though, um, we have tools for dealing with it that are a lot better than we have. Uh, as for example, doctors, et cetera, we finance their education, bring them into the military in return for a six-year commitment, that kind of thing. Um, we pay people higher than the norm when they have special skills in areas that we've historically recognized, like medical or nuclear engineering and the like. Um, but part of the attraction of the FFRDC world for me is that I'm not in the government pay scale any longer and I can begin to respond more to market forces. Third, um, comes back to your point about uh, what's sexy, a uh, subject that uh, computer scientists are always inclined to speak about. Um, the reality, I haven't specified in what realm, um, the reality is that the government work is phenomenally sexy. That's why NSA historically has been able to draw people. They know they can work on the best of the tools and the like. You're going to tell me it's offense. No, no, no yeah. So to be fair, we, yes, TAO recruits from this community uh, successfully with the sales pitch, hey, you can be a cowboy with us and do things that you couldn't do legally anywhere else. Right. But hey, protect our database is not, does not have the same pull. I think that's right. Um, uh, I think that's right. But I do think that if I could create uh, an entity that has some brand and that is high end and that gets over a number of problems of government employment associated with everything from credentialism to dress code, um, if I could create a critical mass of people, that mass would be attractive unto itself. And because ultimately the most marketable skill is the defensive skill, not the offensive skill, uh, it would be, I think, a natural kind of training ground for people. And again, in the FFRDC, I can move people back and forth more readily between government and private industry. So the first point still stands. This is going to be a problem. But I can do better in regard to it, I think, by what I've described. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate your concern for scholarships and students, and I want to share an experience with you. As you know, the military has a fellow in every congressional office where the member 
is on one of the Armed Services Committee or the Budget Committee. I went to every You're really revealing state secrets here, but go ahead. I went to every single one of those offices and asked them to support additional investment in scholarships for students who want to work for the United States government or are willing to work for the United States government. Not one of them was interested. It is not a DOD policy to invest in these scholarships. Every single year, the NSA investment has decreased monotonically. And last year, the DOD spent more on pencils than they did on scholarships. So if you actually are interested in meeting the goal you want to meet, there are very clear policy ways to do it. There are existing, existing programs. And so, per, you know, this is really nice. Gosh, I'm happy you're here. But, you know, try to spend as much on scholarships next year as you do on pencils. Well, so it, it's uh, a, a nice statement, very gently delivered. Uh, of, uh, I'm known for my delicacy. Uh, s stick with it. Um, basically, I view these phenomena as lag phenomena. Um, you know, when I was Navy Secretary, I uh, once gave a talk in which I put up a picture of the program for the Army-Navy football game on December 5th, 1941. And it was a large ad that said, no battleship has ever been sunk from the air. Uh, this is the day before Pearl Harbor. Um, there just wasn't a sense of, uh, it's very hard for people to adjust to the new. Uh, so in the scholarship programs, for example, there are existing constituencies that care fundamentally about their allocation of money. And when you argue in the Pentagon that we ought to put more money into the scholarship program, not just take it away from some others, et cetera, to deal with the things you're describing, the general reaction is, uh, I do weapons, I don't do scholarships. So the line you're offering, which is a right one, doesn't strike, it doesn't surprise me that you're encountering resistance, but I think basically your point is right. We need to invest longer term in a richer way in this arena. So I would encourage you to keep at it, and I'll try and chip in. I look forward to your investment. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Rachel Greenstead, Drexel University. Can you uh, tell me first whether you're going to ask me for an investment? Um, not no, go this ahead. time, I believe, though. Okay. You know, I'd, I'd welcome it, actually, but, you know. I think it, it, this is sort of a follow-up in, in something that Stefan alluded to, which is the sort of the, the TAO and our sort of offensive capabilities in, the, in these areas. Uh, the fact that we've kind you know, people seem to talk about security a lot and, and defense, but we often have the same organizations involved in, in defensive efforts as offensive efforts, and it looks from the outside in many times that when there's a conflict, we invest in, we're sort of more enamored of the offensive capabilities and invest in having more insecurity so that we can exploit it rather than more security. <laughs> Maybe because it seems more easier in a lot of ways because you, know, you can easily exploit these things, whereas to secure things you have to secure right. everything and so on. How, how, can you, how can we address that and how can we have kind of trust in the government's efforts to do these sorts of things? Well, I think you point to a fundamental problem and it's of a piece with what we were discussing with Stefan, uh, the attraction of the offense, uh, particularly to professionals who are more engaged in offensive things. I mean, historically, put aside digital new, new things. Uh, military has been more attentive to its offensive capability than to its ability to defend its logistics supply chain. And it proves to be costly in actual combat when you have that imbalance that you're, you're describing. Um, I do think it comes in many ways down to education, though. That's really why I'm invested in trying to explain this. Uh, maybe the biblical injunction that the truth shall set you free isn't right. But I believe that if we agree that the challenge of leadership in these arenas is to get people ahead of the crises, you have to make it real to them. You have to explain it to them. And that involves not just saying in abstract, for example, these systems are complex and concentrated and may crash. 
uh, but it involves showing them that they involve 50 million lines of code or 14 trillion transistors manufactured every second and giving them a sense of that vulnerability and then of the consequences of it. Um, and I believe through education on these points, leaders can be brought along to make more of the defensive investments that you're rightly arguing for. I wish I could give you a more powerful answer, but it's not some switch I can pull. It's planting the seeds here and there and everywhere. It's organic. Yes? Hi, uh, Jeremy Epstein, National Science Foundation. A uh, usual <laughs> disclaimer about my opinions, not the government's opinions, blah, blah, blah. Um, so uh, the, uh, you talked about the difference between different industries and how uh, banking has different concerns and threats than the power industry and so on. And um, uh, I, I work in, in um, my personal research is in the voting area and we, we see uh, a lot of uh, folks saying that uh, in, um, we can do internet voting because it's, it's really not that big a risk. Um, uh, and then Ron Rivest, who's somewhere in the audience today, says um, uh, we, we uh, shouldn't uh, ask why if I can bank online, I can't vote online, but instead we should be asking if internet voting is safe, uh, why aren't they running the security for the banks uh, um, <laughs> if, if they've figured it all out? So my question is, are, are there other sorts of uh, parts of the economy uh, other than voting that have this sort of misconception that they alone are safe and uh, when the rest of the world hasn't figured out how to be secure, but they are secure. And how do we help them understand what you've been talking about today? Uh, I do think there are areas of confidence in the world which have varying degrees of legitimacy for them. Uh, for example, uh, the military classified system or the NSA system, um, I think people believe in, and in my opinion, uh, there are commercial analogs to that. For example, the SWIFT system and the like. Uh, what interests me, <coughs> the SWIFT system being the mechanism for transfer of funds between banks. Which was hacked a couple of years ago. Yeah, uh, but the, I think they, with some, reason can point to a strong record of uh, extraordinary numbers of dollars of transactions relative to the penetrations. But your point is right, that is there's the vulnerability still inherent in these systems. What interests me the most about them is can we generalize about what makes those systems strong and about where that vulnerability lies and what we can do about it. So for example, to the degree those systems already, as some of them do, use analog to protect themselves, or multiple factor authentication, or decentralization and decoupling so that the intrusion in one part of the system still leaves the system resilient to recovery. That's a very helpful thing. Um, and we want, I think, <coughs> to emphasize to them their vulnerabilities, but to the rest of the world that they have gotten a greater degree of protection. So let me just give an example. I talked about red team and auditing. How many companies not only do penetration testing with their red teams for their audit committees and the like, but say to the attackers, now we're going to privilege you within the system and see how much damage you can do before we stop you. That's a very valuable tool that smart companies use, but others, uh, less smart companies don't. So I want to see us observe these kinds of best practices and spread them. And you're seeing things like uh, Sigital has a system for sharing this kind of information. Uh, Dan Gear has been running something which swaps information between Z-cells. I think that kind of activity is very useful. Uh, so I'm after observing these systems quite closely, both to sensitize their operators to the fact that they are vulnerable, you're in my point, but also to observe the best practices from them. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, great talk. I'm Tudor Dimitris from the University of Maryland, College Park. And I have a more technical question about uh, your uh, patch, uh, lack of patch deployment example. So we've been, we've been doing some work on measuring patch deployment, and we saw that uh, the more recent uh, techniques for si silent patching are actually able to patch fairly large vulnerable populations quickly. So what do you 
think are the barriers to uh, uh, adopting this approach? Is it the fear that you might destabilize the system or that an adversary might inject malicious patches or regulatory concerns? Or I, I'm sorry, are you asking about the barriers to observation of the system or no, the barriers? The barriers to patch uh, silently without user intervention. The barriers to patching? Yes, to yeah. adopt an approach that, because that, that is the fastest way to yeah. disseminate patches. Yeah. Well, um, I think it's pretty striking to me that um, all the systems we come up with um, wind up being subject to subversion, tokens, encryption, uh, enclaves, uh, these observational kinds of capabilities, et cetera. Um, and with each new technical innovation, it's perfectly useful step forward. I applaud the kind of work you're doing, but it leaves us ultimately, our experience is persistently that the attackers then find a weakness in, in that part of the system. So I would expect that you're gonna see the same thing in the arenas that, that you're describing um, over the time uh, immediately ahead. Right, but how, how do you reason, how do you balance you know, the insecurity caused by the right. vulnerabilities that are not patched fast enough with the possibility that something, you know, the, the patching system might get, uh, might be subverted? Yeah, well, I'm constantly in the patching system balancing the, uh, the, the complications of patching, the introduction of a new system, the business costs, and so on with the uh, security requirements uh, that I'm getting from it. And in my view, it's an art. I mean, there is no general rule I can, I can offer. I feel very different about it in different industrial kinds of contexts, depending on how central the security issue is and the like. Um, I also, though, ultimately believe that the supply of zero days for a serious state attacker is great enough that they're gonna constantly find things even when we have patch. I'm happy to talk about this further separately though if you'd like. Thank you. Thanks. I'll take the last two questions and then I should stop. Hello, uh, sir. Cynthia Irvin, Naval Postgraduate School. I'm going to ask you about uh, the question of building the resilient systems and doing the engineering. How uh, would you suggest that the acquisition process be changed so that the speed of technology is integrated more quickly and effectively into the systems uh, given the ponderous nature and uh, resistance to change in the acquisition process. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of speed in these contexts. In the Pentagon context, um, this is another example of the embedded power of the past. The procurement process was designed uh, in a world where we confronted an adversary, the Soviet Union, that was remarkably ponderous. The system co-evolved with the Soviet Union, and I, I, this is the story of my life in some dimensions. The, uh, uh, if the Soviets were developing a new tank, we would learn about it, intelligence and the like. They would have a five-year plan succeeded by another five-year plan. We, on our side, became just like them. We would develop a five-year plan to develop a new tank to proceed as long as faster than their five-year plan. We did okay. I once gave a speech in which I observed that with the fall of the uh, Soviet Union, uh, the world's largest surviving operating communist system is the U.S. military. Um, five-year plans, uniformity, you name it, uh, repression of freedom of speech. Uh, we have all the attributes of a good communist system. Uh, so moving to the speed that you're rightly pointing out is absolutely uh, imperative. And in fact, the system is designed to de-risk by constantly uh, surveying what we're going to acquire, whereas it's actually introducing more risk for the reason you're rightly pointing out, which is the speed of change. So what we need to do is invest more and more in spiral development and take advantage of the fact that software can be revised and buy much more quickly and buy instead of buying with the notion that this stuff's going to last 15 or 30 years, the life of a typical airplane or of a ship, uh, that in fact it's going to be quickly outmoded, six months, one year, two years, so that it's constantly going to be refreshed. And in my view, that's a different system and it requires an investment of energy to get us from here to there. But your proposition is, in my opinion, right, 
and we need to move down the path you're describing. Thank you. Last question. Hi, Susan McGregor, Columbia Journalism School. Um, I will say that I really appreciate the focus on the application of security and industry, um, and especially the point you made about kind of having leaner technologies. Um, my favorite example in that is the Samsung television that records what you say in your living room uh, and transmits it to Samsung. Uh, but my question is that given that we live in an information economy and a lot of business models are currently built on the collection of information, um, how do we incentivize industry to actually produce technologies that are lean in that way when a lot of their thinking about how they're going to actually make money has to do with collecting user data and then selling it or operationalizing it or yeah. something like that? So uh, this raises a whole big topic uh, that, that's very important. Um, about the relationship between security and privacy and incentives to sell data. Um, one of the things that's striking to me, though, is to me, security is actually more fundamental to the business model of these enterprises than they recognize. And it's more fundamental to privacy than privacy advocates tend to recognize. Um, for example, uh, I like, I think everybody in this audience do not like the idea of the US government reading my email. But if I entirely stay out of the security business, at least in my case, I'm pretty confident that I'm subscribing to a world where the Chinese government reads my email. On balance, I like that a little less, or you can say you dislike them both. The security requirements are fundamental to the privacy interests that I've got. And similarly, if companies are going to go out there and uh, acquire data on me and the like, at a minimum, their business model has to depend on keeping that data secure. And if it turns out that people can raid that data and I'm Target and other people acquire uh, credit card information from my company, the reality is my company suffers mightily. You would think that lesson would be learned uh, it is being learned, but it's being learned slowly. You know, J.P. Morgan uh, had, as I recollect, a, an, uh, uh, a cybersecurity investment level estimated at $250 million. After they got hacked, they raised it to $450 million, public filings with the SEC written up in the Wall Street Journal. We need to start shutting those doors sooner. I'm still going to have fundamental tensions between our uh, desire in the companies to acquire data and our privacy interests as citizens. But at least both ends of this equation ought to recognize that more security would protect both their business interests and my privacy interests. So we're clearly sub-optimizing even before we get to a trade-off between things. So on this note, um, I think I should end and thank you all very much uh, for uh, your involvement and patience, but particularly to the degree you can get involved in this policy discussion. Uh, I, I really feel as though the fundamental problem is getting people at the point where they understand this better. Policy people, lay people and the like, also professionals like yourselves who may not normally have as developed a set of policy interests. If you buy my analogy to the world of gunpowder, these huge changes are occurring. We're talking about a number of them in the course of the day. People's minds lag behind. The only way to get us moving further uh, is to bring people's understanding to a richer point. And for that, if you don't do it and I don't do it, who's going to do it? Uh, ultimately, it depends on you. So I hate to impose a, uh, a big national security problem on you, but you are, after all, meeting in Washington. You have to act as though you are. Thanks a lot.